You tried. I know, we tried. We tried. A little skid action going. It's live. Good morning. Good morning. <sighs> Why is it every time I walk into a room, they scatter? So, welcome this morning. My name is Glenn Robbins. This is Lisa Carlton. We are both from Northfield Middle School. I'm going to take this thing off now. <laughs> Does this look like your current school? <laughs> you have your administrators and you have your teachers, two different sides, right? And it's a frustration. Why? Why do we have that? And as Barry mentioned earlier, the key to all this today is collaboration being in it together. But yet in a school, or most businesses or society, it's always a competition. It's always against one another. Four years ago, I came into a new building with a struggle. And the struggle was, in the first 15 minutes, I had two grievances given to me. We had no contract for a year. The building closed for mold. Superintendent at the time had two lawsuits against her. And yeah, by the way, welcome new guy. How are you? And that was part of the frustration because this established what you're looking at right now. Because you have two different sides who have been through multiple years of hardship and many different things that affect their lives. All right, thank you, Nick Diaz, for that suit. Okay. That's your normal principle, right? That's your usual culture. We talk about test scores, we talk about data, we talk about results, always wanting them, and this is usually how it sets up. So when I first came into Northfield, this is how I felt, and we had to try to change that. You want to talk about? That's how we felt too. Okay. Okay, uh, what Glenn left out is we are a very small district. How many teachers do we have upstairs? Uh, about 60. 60 that teachers. Carrier than everybody else. That works. Do I need a microphone? That works. Good, good. Keep going. Um, that includes Paris and everybody else. Mm -hmm. 60 upstairs. There are five teachers per grade level sometimes six, so that's it. So it's a very small district with two lawsuits, no contract, um, a new principal. This is how we felt, too. Okay. And he's our seventh, he's, I've been teaching for 19 years. He was my seventh principal. Uh, how many people have had that struggle? My former school, I was a, in the school for nine years, we had five principals, three superintendents. The current one that I'm in now, we had three superintendents in four years. Anybody else had that similar struggle? Yeah, if we were like an NBA basketball team, we'd be worse than the Sixers, right? <laughs> Just think about that. But yet we're driven by results, we're driven by our culture, we're driven by our, our climate. Now this is how Lisa felt for a long time, and she still does on certain days, depending on what kind of day it is. Mondays. <laughs> Mondays, okay. But how many of you feel that as well in here? You know, you don't have to show your hands if you don't want to, but think about your climate, think about your culture. Are you supported throughout the day to make you feel like you can still stand on a desk? Or are you so repressed by, by the end of the day, you are literally running out the door to sheer happiness? <laughs> That's just the reality. But why do we continue to do this reality? Why do we continue to suffer? Let me interject for a yes. second. Our culture at that time was we have to be there at 8 o'clock. Teachers showed up at 7.59, and we can leave at 3 o'clock, and the building was empty by 3.01. There wasn't a soul around. It was a very uh, stagnant climate that we worked in, and we didn't see it changing. Does that look familiar to some of your bosses? <laughs> So 
you, you often think about culture, you think about climate, you think about results, but how can you truly be successful when you're being micromanaged or that they're looking down upon you 24-7? Where's the autonomy? Where's the passion? Where's the purpose at? If you constantly feel that this guy or this gal is over your shoulders. Now, I was a product of this. I was a product of this for many years because that's all I ever knew. And when I accepted a job as a principal, I worked for a woman that was the only woman in the state, I'll be honest with you, I probably applied to every one of your districts in this room. <laughs> she was the only one that gave me a chance. So I always love her for that, but she did have her faults, and her faults were extreme micromanaging. And she understands that, and she admits that. But to me, it was very hard to try to change the culture. Talk about your experience as a teacher for years. Uh, well, my one experience, I'm very fortunate, maybe, um, <laughs> that I teach in the district where I live and where my daughters go to school. They're in the same building as me. We have downstairs, that's K to four, and then upstairs, that's fifth through eighth. That's where I teach. And on the very first day of my daughter's, my younger daughter's kindergarten, I said, Glenn, past practice, we're always allowed to run downstairs, watch our kids walk in, snap a picture. I'm sorry, you can't. It's not from me, but you can't. That was the first time you made me cry. The second time is when he told me he was leaving. <laughs> and that was my first day of school that year and it set the tone, and then Glenn says, hey, let's go to Washington, D.C. with the kids. And I said, mm, I can't. <laughs> it killed me to say that, but that's not who I am. I would never take from the children. But the climate that was created, and the experiences, and the, um, is your foot in your classroom? Instead of the little, you know, the teach in the morning, you're five minutes before the kids come in when all of the great ideas happen with your cup of coffee. We didn't have that. And everybody, you couldn't even talk to somebody because the teacher across the hall from me had a lawsuit. The teacher down the hall from me had a lawsuit. So it was a very difficult climate for all of us, you included. He was just the middle man. Right? Yeah. And unfortunately, a lot of you look like this. <laughs> because of the stress of the job. Come on now. And I know I'm calling out a lot of administrators in here, but this is what we're doing to people. You know? And think about all the crazy things that we have, especially in the state of New Jersey, that's hammering down on these individuals. It's not fair. We're responsible for the most precious product that any family is ever sending us, not their children. But we're also responsible for so many different mandates and standards that we have to cover that we have to have that true nourishment and support of working together instead of being apart. Now, we talk about leadership, and it's easy for me to say because I've been there, done that. And a lot of you are saying, well, maybe I work in a school where I feel repressed, or I work in a school where I'm restricted, or I have no autonomy. Leadership is not about rank. Leadership is about you having the courage to stand up and try something new. It's the courage to present something new to your fellow coworkers or to your students. It doesn't matter who you are in the building. But a lot of times, we take in that anger, and we take in those frustrations, and we display it the wrong way. So my challenge to you is how can you go back and truly make a difference in your building to your students? Because they deserve it. Because remember, a lot of you are parents in here. You want nothing but the best for your individual child. But yet, when you look at your classroom, are you truly doing that? Are you truly able to have those conversations with your fellow classmates and teachers? You know, are we having meaningful conversations, or are we beating them senseless? It goes back to the old 80s phrase that some teachers, and I've lived this, the beatings will continue until the attitude improves. <laughs> How many people feel that way? Or are you constantly beat down? You want to add anything? I can just piggyback on what Glenn was saying and maybe fast forward a little bit. Um, we just got our state test scores back. And that's oh. a different story. Oh, new topic, keep going. 
but um, what is failed to make its way to the forefront, I think, is all of the recognition that we've gotten and everything that our school has done. I know a lot of you have been into my hallway, our class, our studios. Um, and I think that's what gets lost. So if you don't have a supportive staff, administration, this is how you feel. What's test scores, map scores. Hit the, next, hit the next slide. I can personally say I had this for a while. And I had this as a teacher. I had this as an administrator. In fact, I got it as a father and a husband, too. That's a whole other story. All right. But we have to truly think about the mindfulness of our students, and we talk about the mindfulness of our staff. Are we giving them the correct amount of time to have those open conversations? Are we giving them time or an outlet to blow up frustration? You know, the last thing that we want is to keep the lights on at the liquor store down the street, because you're not having any money made off of that, or teachers going out on disabilities, whatever it may be. It's not fair to them. This is a way of their life. They got in it for a reason, to change the lives of children. But unfortunately, that changes as more mandates come down on them. And that's a frustration that we all share in this room. It's a frustration we all share. But the big thing is your mental health. How are you taking care of yourself? Once again, it goes back to you being a leader. How are you taking care of yourself after a frustrating day? You know, are you running out of the building with a smile? Are you driving home listening to Metallica on a road rage? What are you doing? Are you going for a run? Are you going for a walk? Are you talking to your children? What are you doing for yourself to grow? What are you doing for yourself to change the current situation that you're in? You know, like I mentioned earlier, you need to be courageous. You can't be complacent. If you have complacency, you'll continue to do the same thing over and over again. Instead, we have one life at this. We have one opportunity. What are you going to do to be that change agent, not only for your students, but also for yourself? And that's a tough question sometimes, because you have so many other factors that go into it. But one of the things that I saw, and we still joke around, is I still had teachers that walk around that still have PTSD. I had, when I first came in, I was on my cell phone a lot. I was checking emails, doing Twitter. And people were looking at me like, are you allowed to do that? And then they started going out, and they're like, can we do that? Can we, can we drink coffee and walk at the same time? Are we allowed? Without a lid. What's that? Without a lid. Without a lid. <laughs> you know? And it wasn't prep period, right? Those are frustrations. And I had to, as a leader, try to change those frustrations that they had. Leach mentioned that's how they felt. This is how they felt every single day. Why was that fair? What is our best product that we're going to put out if everybody is not happy? We talk about leadership, it's all about the students, it's all about the students. From the leadership standpoint, it's about our staff, it's about our employees. Creating that culture for then the kids will be happy. Go ahead. Um, I can see, well, Glenn encouraged us to take risks in a time where risks weren't really the trend in education, I don't think. I think it's more accepted now. Um, he wanted us to do things that weren't graded and we didn't have a lesson plan for and poor attendance for that matter. The kids were just going to show up and we were going to educate them. And it was a, because of this and because of the data and the lesson plans and everything else we had to meet, it was a very precarious line to walk. And in a matter of four years, mm -hmm. it's completely changed and revamped the product that we put out with our students. I have kids, I mean, we've, we've always had successful kids. I don't like to think so. <laughs> they go to my high school. <laughs> um, but the kids that we have now are so much more involved. They've become confident in their education. They've become a stakeholder in their education because we have allowed to do that. Because we've moved away from this, and we've moved away from some traditional um, ideology and giving kids the voice. And I think our kids that we have turned out the past year or so are ready to take on what's next. We were going to show this video clip. How many people have seen the Lego movie? Everything is awesome, right? It's song gets stuck in your head. 
All right, this is what every administrator wants you to think every single day. Everything is awesome. All right, nothing changes. You guys are great. And yet, like Lisa said, it puts out the same product over and over and over again. It puts out the same kids over and over and over again. It's not fair. So it gets to a point where you start talking about observations. How many people feel like this? <laughs> That's a reality, right? <laughs> the administrator walks in the room, you drop everything. Or you jump straight up, you throw the ace out of your pocket. Here's the lesson we're doing today. That has nothing to do with what we were learning. Yes, but this is the lesson we're doing today. <laughs> all right? We've all been there. I'm guilty of it. You know, it's like similarly when I walked in, they all scatter. All right? It's a fear. So in an observation, we have to think about what are we trying to truly do? And like Lisa said, we tried to change some of the ideologies and pedagogy and make it more of an andragogy where the, the kids took more responsibility. We're in a middle school, grades five through eight. What we didn't mention is we lead the country in foreclosed homes and we lead the country in unemployment in our county, We're right outside of Atlantic City. All right, 250 foreclosed homes and 2.5 square miles. So there are struggles that these kids have. And we had to understand those struggles, you know. But by doing traditional observations, yeah, we have, you know, the format, we have the, uh, the platform and so forth. But we needed to start to think about what is truly on an observation. Now, I put some of these up here, and Lisa's going to talk about some of her experiences. Anybody ever been docked for chewing gum during the middle of an observation? No one? Oh, you guys are lucky. How about shades that were crooked? One, two? Yeah, your shades were crooked? What does that do with improving the life of a child? I'm confused. And I can say this because my wife was a product of this. And it mind boggled me, as an administrator, as I was turned into the dark side and went to that side, I was told I had to find faults at every single thing. Well, what if the teacher was simply outstanding, the best thing you've ever seen? Find a fault. How's that fair? You deserve to be recognized, and you deserve to be pushed to continue to strive to a higher level instead of denouncing you. I put this one up. I know you can barely see it. How many people have to have like a trillion things on the board before your administrator walks in? All right, if not, you're docked for that. Lise, what else? You want to talk about dress code? Or anything, yeah? Yeah. Um, <laughs> we got in trouble for wearing open toed shoes. Yes. We live in a beach town. I put my fancy flip flops on today. But we cannot, we could not wear open toed shoes. And when we walked into school, it was this in the morning. And we would hide our open toed shoes under our desks and go in with whatever we were supposed to wear and then slip them on and hope that administration did not come into the, your room that day. That was what was important, and that was the message that was sent to us. It didn't matter what you were doing in your classroom, just make sure your toes are covered. <laughs> and that's when the message that was delivered to the children, and the message that eventually got out to the parents, and that was our work environment. So imagine that. That's a frustration to me, because I was the middle person, trying to follow through what they wanted, but trying to see the realities of what we were going through. So luckily, we changed that several years later, and now the ladies can wear open toe shoes. But I can't, so I'm still frustrated by that. Like, <laughs> like I said, I just want to chop the top of my shoe off and walk in, you know, so I can look <laughs> like the part. But the question then begs is, you know, dress code. We talk about dress to success. We talk about what do you wear, you know, presents. But a lot of time we find that people are pressing the suit on you, you know, and does it really do anything differently? You know, I had the opportunity to travel the world last year and see so many different schools in action. And one of the things that truly blew me away was when I was at Stanford University and the Dean of Education, I cannot wait to hear, walks up looking like he's going to the next Jimmy Buffett concert. <laughs> and this is Stanford. And I'm saying to myself, he's on to something here. What truly works? Now, I'm not talking about rolling out of bed and looking like a slob. But I'm talking about when you go into your classroom, are you willing to get dirty? You know, my staff will find me on a ladder or hammering stuff with my sleeves rolled up, jacket off, and so forth. Painting on desks. Painting on desks, yeah, I did that all summer long. Painted 15 different studios with uh, sketch pad 
paint, uh, dry erase board uh, paint so they could write on for the kids. That demonstrated that I was willing to get out of my ivy tower, and the same thing for the teachers. They were willing to get out from behind that desk. You have to have a desk, right? You're willing to get out and learn with the kids. How many times have you gone in and you're doing something awesome and technology fails? Yeah, this is like the Zoolander thing right here. If you've ever seen Zoolander, like the files are inside the computer. Like, how do you find them? This was a struggle of mine when we were doing presentations as a teacher, and then the administrator walked in and said, well, what is that? that? I don't know what that is, and that's a frustration, or vice versa. So what are we doing to truly help each other grow in the field of technology, instead of it continuing to ignore it every single time and saying, oh, we don't need to worry about it? And lastly is my favorite. You know, stop packing your bags. We still have 15 seconds left. <laughs> All right. How many of you have to teach bell to bell? Come on, hands up. Give it. Let's go. Bell to bell. Stand and deliver for 45, 65, 80 minutes. That doesn't work. You want to talk about Egg Camp and what we did to truly revamp a lot of this stuff? Um, I am guilty of this, though, not because I have to, because I want to, and they keep taking minutes away from me. <laughs> Um, but our Ed Camp program that we do, I don't have any of you visited our Northfield Community School. I know some faces look familiar. If you had a chance to see our Ed Camp, I wish you had a chance to see it last August or September when it was Glenn on one side and our curriculum coordinator. Was Bob there? No. First, the teachers <laughs> in a room, and he said, Listen, we're going to have an unstructured part of the day. We want you to get in there with the kids, do what they want to do, be what they need you to be, at all costs. What's wrong with this guy? And we sat there, and then he would leave the room, and we're like, what? Now what? what yeah, I think your words were, you on drugs before I left that. <laughs> I think that's why I said And he left and left us to talk about it, and we I work with a wonderful team of people, and we laughed and joked and made some jokes, and then we got down to business and actually worked out what Ed Camp is, and Glenn kind of guided us through this, but he said, don't worry about dress code, don't worry about standards, don't worry about test scores, because I clearly remember saying to him, what? I'm a tested subject and you're taking time away from what I'm supposed to be doing and it's on my observation, don't worry about it. So we tried it and we did it and when all restrictions were off, we had kids running down the hallway. They couldn't wait to sign up for whatever uh, was being offered. It was a work in progress. It started off great, then it got a little dangerous. <laughs> And then it got better. <laughs> yeah, it looked like a mosh pit, like a Metallica concert. So. <laughs> kids signing up. But when's the last time you had kids literally running to sign up for a course that wanted to be there? And the joy of it, like Lisa was saying, is if you were teaching, you were doing it wrong. Because the teachers were off to the side as facilitators. They were learning with the kids. You know, and to have that, hey, take a risk. Hey, something new. To go step outside of your comfort zone, transform not only the teachers, but also the kids. You know, and that was something I've never seen before. <laughs> Any people who watch Vice Principals? <laughs> I feel that way. Anybody else see a grievance in the middle of a <laughs> keynote? Thanks. <laughs> Appreciate it. <clears throat> yeah, that was nice. Thank you. Let's talk about that for a second. I used to be that guy. I can say that. I used to be that guy. You know, this is the way it has to be. This is the way it has to be done. Why? Because that's all I ever knew. That's all I ever saw. And what happens to that? It leads to these. It leads to these. Why? Because you're too big headed and you can't listen to anybody else but yourself. And that's a frustration because it's a team effort. It's a team effort. We need to be able to take a step back, not only as an administrator, not only as teachers, but all staff in the building to work together. You know, the one teacher that I meet with every single day is my union president, Ms. Kristen Pollock. Every single day I meet with her. I push my ego aside so we can work together. And don't get me wrong, there are some days where we'll scream at each other behind closed doors. 
And there's other days we talk about family. But at the end of the day, it's checking the ego at the door. And that's hard for a lot of us to do because you've always felt empowered. You always felt like this is the way to do it. Think about that for a minute. If you removed your ego, and as somebody said the other day, walked into a meeting stupidly. I, it blew me away when I heard that. Walk into a meeting stupidly. Meaning, you're walking in completely unbiased. You're not looking at it from the lens of who you are and thinking about what can we do to better the problem that's on the table. But too many times we come in and we draw a hard, si a hard line in the sand saying, it's this way or the other way, which leads to grievances, which leads to disruption, which leads to mass chaos, which leads to the next thing. Anybody have this? A meeting to the meeting for the meeting? Yeah. All right, sort of like right now, like you're suffering through this with us, right? You have to be in here because it's a keynote. Start thinking about some of the meetings. Administrators in here, I challenge you, all right, to start thinking about how you run your meetings. And teachers, I challenge you to go back and think about how you can present to your faculty and to your administration how you could change things. Because most of the time, this is the meeting. I'm standing on the soapbox, I'm talking, you're all giving me a one on my observation right now because I've been lecturing to you for like the last 20 minutes. And then I go tell you, hey, go do some risk taking, go do some differentiated instruction, go do something differently, but this is how I'm gonna model it to you. How does that change? Cool, five minutes, five minutes, we're almost there, thank you. How does that change? How many people give that look in a faculty meeting to another person? <laughs> How many people play bingo in a meeting? Yes, come on, how many people grade papers? How many people check their cell phone? How many people sleep? I'm guilty of all the above, all right? If it's not productive, what are we doing there? What are we doing there? We need to question ourselves, why are we truly having meetings for meetings? One of the things I did was I went to my union president and I said, I don't like standing up in front of all of you and grilling you. I want this to be productive, professional development time, meaningful time to do something after school or during an in-service instead of getting somebody to lecture and wanting to stab your eyes out. There's nothing more brutal than that when you're bored to death. So I got two offers to her. I said, look, first offer is I'm gonna show Snow White for 59 minutes during an hour faculty meeting. And then I'm going to give you a long piece of paper that says all my agenda and walk out. Or we could do something true, meaningful PD. They chose B. What we've done since then, you've had reflection time. Where do you get to go back to the room? Good. Mini golf. Mini golf. <laughs> Our MD room made golf. So we had golf in the hallway. All right. We had 20% uh, time. We had makerspace challenge where we did a cardboard challenge. Who could ever design the table to do, I'm sorry, a chair to do the best? We just handed out uh, breakout EDU equipment as well. Stuff that it's meaningful. Yeah, there are days where they go back with the PLCs and they analyze data, all right? There are days where we do professional development and we're doing something along those lines, but it's meaningful. It's not something that you're trying to stab your eyes out. Yeah. I'm sure you all had this problem before. For those who can't see it, it says, my administration said we have smaller class sizes this year. Based on the janitor bringing in more desks to my room, we've determined that is a lie. <laughs> okay, at the next one. This is a picture from last week at a school I visited. <laughs> All right, hit the next slide. And what this is pumping out, I know this is tough to see, but it says, you were educated in the public school system, what does that qualify to do? And then he says, is this mobile choice true, false, or fill in the blank? All right, so like we talked about, we want to try to prepare our students for the standards they have to cover and more. Are we giving them the soft skills? Are we creating an environment for them to be successful once they leave us? And I know this is the trend right now. We have a computer lab where we go in and do computing because that's what's awesome with computers. And then we have maker spaces on the other side and that's once again, oh, we have a maker space. And we go into that one room where it's just making. My challenge to you, if you have this as you're moving forward, what are you trying to do? What are you willing to do to make it a true culture of creativity? A true building where it's not just pockets of greatness sporadically spread out. 
How can you do transformational things to make your building more creative to get the teachers the leeway to do what they need to do? Or pick up their settlements on Facebook. Sure, my studio gets me. I'm going to end with this. I know we're pressing for time. Mentors. All right. You're only as good as your mentor. And this is the frustration that I've had. Get the next slide for me. Because we usually generate this. <laughs> you know, mentors to have the newer staff share with the older staff and then have it in a traditional way. But here's my challenge to you. And this was a frustration that I had as an administrator going through. I was being told that I was being given a certain assistant principal to follow. I went to that administrator, the principal, and said, no, I don't want her. I want this other person. This person has a lot better reputation. This person is somebody that everybody in the building models. Well, no, you can't have that person because that other person is next on the list. How is that fair if we're trying to create better teachers or better administrators if we're always going by a list? How is that fair for the young ones or whoever's coming out, whatever it may be, if you're modeling after the last person on the list who's not the best teacher, not the best administrator? So my challenge there to you is how can we try to change that? You know, how can we show that it doesn't have to always be that way? You know, show them that your transformative ways work. When you go in and you have a student teacher, or you have an observation, what are you doing to truly help that person transform to a better teacher? Or are you too busy going through that hedonic adaptation, which is the same thing over and over and over again, that you forget that you're truly modeling for somebody that's gonna change the world one day? That's scary. We'll end with this. Leadership is not about being in charge. Leadership is about taking care of those in your charge. That's as a teacher, that's as a janitor, that's as the people at the front door, that's the bus drivers, that's everyone in this room. It's not about power. It's about caring for the others. And it always goes back to what Simon Sinek says. You have to be willing to cater to your employees, your people. That will then transform from Lisa into the teachers, into the community. So I leave you with that challenge. How are you going to go back and take care of those around you? Whether it's the teacher across the hall, whether it's the janitor, whether it's the secretary, whether it's your administrator. How are you going to make that change to make their lives better? Good. Thank you.